Because if all I had was the record of my sins blotted out, that would not help me to become what God had purposed for me in the beginning. I have no power to be anything other than what I am in myself. I need a miracle. I need Christ, the one who came forth from that tomb, victorious over sin and death and the devil and hell itself. I need the one who sits on that throne. I need him to come and to live in here and to, and to live his life. He's the only one who has ever lived the Christian life to begin to empower me and to change me and to enable me to live for him. It doesn't happen any other way. You know, I, I said early on that a lot of times we think of God's law as a bunch of thou shalt nots. But do you know what the law really was about? Jesus was asked on one occasion, what's the greatest commandment? And what did he say? He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Anybody here or thou shalt not in that? You see, it was necessary for a lot of thou shalt nots, but that's not what God was. The, the law of God is not a negative thing. The whole purpose of the law was to bring us into a right relationship with God and with each other. Amen. It's thou shalt not do this. It's not thou shalt not do this. It's thou shalt love. The Lord thy God. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you love your neighbor like you love yourself, you're not going to be going out and murdering them when you're mad at them. You're not going to steal their stuff. You're not going to do all these negative things. That will just automatically follow. Not because you're not trying to do the bad stuff. You're because you're doing what the purpose is to begin with. That's what this sin business is about. It's violation of God's purpose. That we live in a love relationship all around. That's what God is seeking to reproduce. It's his own nature reproduced in his children. That's what everything is about. That's what salvation is about. It's Christ, salvation is Christ living in us and changing us so that we can become his sons and his daughters, so that we can fulfill his original purpose. Oh, his purpose won't even, I mean, we're seeing the beginnings of it, yes, but I mean the real purpose is something that really begins in eternity. This is remedial. This is, this is a remedy. This is, getting, this is taking care of the reason, the thing that's in the way of that. Gets, he gets, takes care of this, and we'll get to that point, and we're going to go forward for all eternity. God. You think God hates pleasure? Oh, he invented it. David said, in thy presence is what? Fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are... What is that? Pleasure. I thought pleasure was bad. No, no. Thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Yes. The full capacity that we have for pleasure will, be, will just be satiated. I mean, the, you talk about the emptiness of pleasure here. That will be fully satisfying without the slightest taint of guilt. Because we'll become like him. Yes. And we will be what he designed us, what he purposed for us to be, and what he designed us, how he designed us to work. We insist on violating the manufacturer's design. If you want to put it that way, it's going to be a mess. You can buck your head against the wall. You can jump off the Empire State Building and defy the law of gravity if you want to. But the end result is not going to be good. Oh, I'll tell you, we've got a God that just has so much in, in store for us we can't even begin to fathom it. Praise God. Let's, let's look at well let's look at one thing that confirms what Jesus said. I, I think it's in Romans 13. You can tell how organized this is. <clears throat> Paul is giving some practical instructions having laid out the, the amazing truths of the gospel 
from uh, chapter 12 on, it's basically how do you take the truths of the gospel and live them out in, a real, in this world. Verse 8, he says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has done what? Fulfilled the law. Well, do I fulfill the law by not doing this and not doing that and not doing the other? No, I fulfill the law by loving. Yes. You love, as he's describing in the word, that takes care of all that. You don't need that. He who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Of course, you've got the fellow who says, I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. You know, you've got this vague, warm, fuzzy, gooey feeling about mankind in general, but everybody around you, you've got conflicts. Well, you, you understand the problem there. The commandments, he goes on to say, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, so that takes in it all, doesn't it? Whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, love is not just a vague attitude. You know, a sin would be doing something to somebody. It might be an attitude, it might be spreading a rumor, but, it's, but you know, you're, you're, there's, some, there's some activity to it. it. It finds expression. But you know, love is not just, well, I love them. Love is actually a positive interaction with people where you're literally doing good. There is literally a, a care and a concern. Just as we're, we have a care and a concern about our own needs, we have a care and a concern. So I just want to drop that in. Love is not just some vague thing. It literally means activity. It means action. It has practical implications in our lives. That's what God is looking for. And I think you could see that in many places in the scripture. Let's uh, turn, if, we, if you will, to Galatians chapter 5. And uh, we'll pick some things from this. Now one of the themes of, of Galatians has to do with the law. There were Jewish believers who had not been able to let go of the law. They still thought of their relationship to God as being based upon rules and rule keeping. And observance of laws and ceremonies and all that kind of stuff. And Paul said it has nothing to do with that. I wish the people that taught that would go to hell, basically is what he says in chapter 1. That sounds like it's pretty important not to fall into that trap. But anyway, his conclusion then of all of that discussion about the place of the law and what Christ has come to give us, it's sort of picked up in chapter 5 this way. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So let's see how he defines freedom. Stand firm then, do not let yourselves be burdened again with a yoke of slavery. Well, there he's talking about the law. Bunch of rules. Measuring yourself by commandments. Mark my words. Well, okay, I'm going to skip over some of that because it's... Basically, he's saying the law is of no value. The only thing, in the middle of verse 6, the only thing that counts. This is what matters. The only thing that counts. From God's standpoint, nothing else matters but this. If you get this, everything else finds its proper place. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. 